Hey. Boom. We're live with DTM, Dan the Man with the Master Plan. Where are you at, dude? Uh, right now, I'm in uh, uh, Prescott Valley, Arizona, dude. Prescott Valley, Arizona. Is, is Arizona a very spiritual place? Um, you know, I think the whole universe is a spiritual place. Wherever you go, the light of light, this light is with, with you. So, um, but like, you know, Sedona kind of has a, um, has a, you know, the vortex is over there and there's a, a lot of spiritual community for sure. Uh, over here, it, Prescott Valley is like a giant strip mall. But what's really cool is I got this dope ass apartment. We're super cheap. I got it the first day I needed it. I just called the lady. She said yes. So it was just, you know, divine. And my best friend lives here. And there's a Sprouts across the street, which is like the best grocery store in the whole area. So it's just, you know, it's like little yogi cave. Did you ever think you were going to leave the trailer park? Uh, well, uh, I don't know if I ever really did. The old saying, you know, you can take the boy out of the trailer park. You can't take the trailer park out of the boy. He is definitely still as ghetto as it gets. <laughs> Would you ever consider going back and living like that? I mean, I live less than that now. I mean, I lived, uh, it was my mom when she was younger in apartments similar to this. This is, this is more luxury here. It's not really, it's kind of like middle of the road, but it was like luxury in the early nineties. Um, and so it's nice and it's solid and everything works and there's a washer and dryer and, um, the floors are hardwood. So, and I've got a, you know, I'm a man, so I've got a shop vac, you know, to do my sweeping and clean up after all my raw food messes and stuff. So it's, it's really, really good. You, you, last time I spoke with you, I think you were in Hawaii. Before that, I don't know, you were in the trailer park or something. How do you decide where you're going to go and live? Like, is it just? I don't. The spirit moves me, man. I was, I was in Hawaii, which I love and I miss because, dude, I would climb two or three times a week, coconut trees and live off coconut water and coconut meat and coconut almond yogurt and papayas and mangoes and like Kauai has the best food in the world as far as I know right. from everywhere I've been by a long shot have you been to Kauai no but I've been to other islands and I felt the same way I'm like these islands have it like this is it and the thing but the thing about Kauai is that it is the garden isle mm -hmm. the garden island so that's what that place does that's what people do there and so there are orchards of trees and avocados that you've never seen before this big just seriously this oh, big dude i used to climb this tree in fact i fell out of it actually and broke my pinky but i was up in this tree and the and the damn things were so big that it just knocked one of them landed on me and knocked me back and i do, 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 do. but wow. no they're just on the side of the road and here's the thing i'm this live food guy right and Nobody really, they go to the store and they get like white rice and spam. Now, some of the hippies, they eat some fruit, but here I am, this is paradise because here's all these avocado trees, hundreds of them on the side of the road. And avocado season is like nine months out of the year, bro, because of all the different varieties. And you just go there and I, everybody knew what my truck looked like. The blue truck with the with the fruit picker out the back loaded with coconuts and i would just drive around live food boy hit the beach take off my clothes and it was a great life but then what you find what's happening right now is that they are the bluest of the blue states mm. they love sickness and they mm. love disease and they worship it and masks mm. are the new religion and and injections of oh. nanoparticles they love it and you have to have three to get in and six is to that get out is of. that why you left i mean it was a combination of a couple of things that was one thing that's my biggest excuse i was also kind of in a relationship that i needed to get out of okay. for my own sake to do the work yeah 
And I was, the island is so small that I kept gravitating just back to this amazing human being. But the, the heart was telling me like, how do you know where to move to? Yeah. My heart was, you know, telling me, you know, I love Kauai, but I wasn't getting the work done that I needed. And I wasn't listening to my inner self because this woman was amazing, but the inner self was telling me, you have this work to do as kind of a masculine spiritual yogi, this breakthrough that you need in order to really even thrive in a relationship. So I'm on this journey for a long time from the kind of the hard childhood, the trauma, and really working on what I consider to be true healing. I mean, we all drink the juice and we do the raw foods and go on a little fast or something. And then our skin gets better and we think that's the end of the road. Yeah. But if you're an old gangster like me and you've got like the pain of a thousand generations in your nervous system and in your pain body, uh, you want to see if you can, you know, what else are you going to do? I mean, I could avoid it. I know how to smoke and drink and hump and eat my way out of anything. But I just kind of, it stopped. All that stuff stopped working quite a while ago. Then the YouTube came and then I was accountable, you know? And they kept me going even further because I had quite a few snapbacks. Just because I went raw doesn't mean I didn't have a lot of little weird binges and crazy snapbacks and all kinds of strange stuff. Then when the YouTube came, I had that accountability, but it also made me pretty tight too because I was real tight. So I had to kind of dip off of there for a while. I'm just always working out my own deal. And I know it's not that well understood because a lot of it is like muscles or weight loss or pretty skin or how you look on Instagram. And I just kept wanting to get through this. Uh, you know, it's, I call it, it's kind of like, like, it's kind of like a demon, a low self-worth demon. Like you're not worthy of love. And it's kind of like the pain of a thousand generations, which I, I lived in that apartment right across the street in that room over there. I did a water fast. I was shooting for 21 days because I'm doing this work to just sit there and burn through it as it's very uncomfortable. And I came up to it and that's where it came to me. I, I, I just called it the pain of a thousand generations just stuck inside of him. And he, it, on day 12 of a fast, it just was too intense. And then, and I came up on that on the 40 day fast as well, but I had just came upon it at the end of the 40 days because I was more distracted and did, I was feeding my church and I was involved in a lot of things during that 40 day fast. Whereas with this power, one, it was much more focused. That's what I've learned to do over the years. Cause I've done, you know, uh, I've done like, 12 and 28 and 11 and six and seven day fast many times learning how to fast mm -hmm. meaning like fast from everything true fasting which i have still i am still you know just open the cracker jack box like i am amateur hour for sure but i'm hoping i'm developing focus determination and just i just i don't it's not like you force it but you just nurture patience. You nurture that centeredness. You're like, oh, I'm very uncomfortable. I want to go eat something. I want to go watch a movie, go get a massage, anything to distract. But let's just sit here with this. And that's what I've been working on because I feel like there's just this old, old, you know, patterns. There's 9,000 names for it, you know, and depending upon what your school of thought is, but I call it the pain of a thousand generations or the pain body or the trauma ball. And so, and, and it, which manifests like anger. And then people on YouTube are like, why are you so angry? It's like, Oh fuck. Let me tell you about my childhood. You know, it's like, I'm not trying to make excuses, but I'm also just trying to be myself. Like it's okay to be angry. It's okay not to be like Lou or like Christina or like Tavis who are all these very well-adjusted people who have just, gotten through it and then the dtm is just i hate to say it i wish i could sit here and just say and maybe i should start saying it well maybe when i'm off camera the honesty is the phase i'm at right now connecting but hopefully because other people they 
they just leave all that and they just go, I am already there. And they have, um, you know, like just Lou is a great example. Like Lou wouldn't swear. And then it's like, well, I'm not Lou, you know, and I just swore, you know. So it's been really hard to not be compared to the people around me. And I, I look up to them, Tavis. I mean, to hear him swear like maybe once or twice in eight years, he's my best friend. Lou, I've never heard him swear. I think Christina swore a few times, you know, I've got to know Christina off camera and she's, she's cool too. And, and just everybody's got their thing down and I just never really got mine down, you know, <laughs> I just never, I just was like, I keep going for the next, I'm like gonna get to the next level and then I'll come out and then I'll be a teacher, you know? I remember, I remember too watching years ago, you said something on YouTube that forever stuck with me. At the time, I think you had been raw for, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years or something at, at one point in this video. And you're like, I feel like I'm just getting started. And I was like, what? No way. Because you've been here for seven, eight years. What do you mean just getting started? And now here I am having done 10 years on Raw. And I'm like, I feel like I'm just getting started. And what you said, I haven't even opened the Cracker Jack box when it comes to fasting. And yet you've done 40 day fast, 21 day fast, 10 day fast, multiple. And I, I get it when you say that, because each time you do it, you, you learn that there's so much more to go. There's so much, you can go so much deeper. You can be so much better, if you will. You can be so much more focused, so much more Zen. And, uh, and you want another chance at it, right? You want another app back, give it, go again, right? So I get that now. But when I first heard you say that, I was like, what does he mean he's just getting started? He's been doing it for so long. So it's, it's, uh, it's never ending, that's for sure. It's never ending. So. The Zen mind, beginner's mind. Yes. Yes. Zero well, point, like a child. Yeah. What is it that you're doing, uh, or what is it that you've been doing lately? So you said off camera, you said that you like, you typically, you come out of a turtle shell, you'll, you'll do your thing, and then you get back into a turtle shell. So now that you're out of your turtle shell, what is it that you're doing every day? What, what's a day in the life of DTM? It's actually really simple. Um, it's pretty cool. I wake up about four or four thirty every morning. I've just trained my mind to do that. My alarm goes off at five. And so at five every morning for the last four years, ever since the 40 day water fast, when I was fasting on about day 37, I was like, okay, God, I'm just about to wrap this up. Um, and it was like 3.30 in the morning and you can never sleep towards the end of a long water fast. You just don't need to sleep one or two hours. And it's 3.30 in the morning. I said, okay, and I'm out there on the floor and I said, okay, now what God, you know? And then I went and sat in the middle of the floor and I actually went into a full Lotus, which I've been working on my whole life. So when you're fasting, your joints become like a three-year-old girl, right? Especially that long into a fast. Oh yeah, I went into full lotus and it was amazing. But instantly I was like, wow, I'm in full lotus. I put my hands in the mudra and I was transported to uh, another lifetime where I was a, a, a monk, shaved head, big, giant, strong Asian monk, red robe, yellow sash in a room with a candle. And it just flashed on me. And it was, and the message was, it's time to really learn how to meditate not 20 minutes here or 20 minutes there once or twice or three times a week when you feel like it, you know what I mean? But actually, because when I first started meditating, I couldn't even meditate sit for five minutes. And then over the years, I dibble dabbled for years, 20 minutes here, you know, 10 minutes here, 20 minutes was kind of the time frame. And then it was just, I knew that it was time. So, and then very, it was just a few days after that, this book came into my life, you know, concentration and meditation which is one of the best books I've ever read. One of the most uh, potent books, uh, Concentration and Meditation by Swami Sivananda. I call him the no BS guru. I read that book and it taught me how to really once and for all meditate. I had already read some of Swami Sivananda's books, but this one was a real game changer because for a personality like mine, a nervous system like mine, with a history like mine, meditation, is um, indispensable prerequisite to getting this, the hemispheres balanced out and, um, you know, learning how to focus and stay calm and be more of the awareness so that you don't respond, you know, so that you can 
your, your response time is much more, uh, you're just, hold on, I'm not gonna, you know, cause you wanna F you, you know, <laughs> like on YouTube, which YouTube is like your greatest teacher. So a day in the life of Dan starts with the meditation, which I can't, just my personal experience, I wanna recommend that an hour a day or whatever. I actually recommend usually 20 minutes to my clients just cause I know what it's like. And you don't wanna, you can't force, you can't force the flower to grow with a hammer. You know what I mean? Just gotta allow. So you're, I'm, I've learned to never fight. Just sort of fight without fighting. Just, just keep on being present and stepping forward. But forcing doesn't work because that creates counter force and eventually wears you out and it doesn't work. So the, the, the meditation is the key. That sets the tone for the day. And it also is interesting. Meditation is also an amazing uh, gauge for your diet. Did you overeat? It's harder to meditate. Uh, are you eating too many spicy combinations? Um, then your mind is like all over the place and you might sit there for one hour just watching your mind just flip flop like a fish out of water. And you're like, wow, I cannot get control of my mind. And then other times you might just drink, drink juice before you go to bed or eat some very plain, simple mono meal or something and just a moderate amount and earlier in the evening. And then you start to get, you know, it's like your evening meal is like four at least before six, go to bed early. Then you see when you wake up in the morning and you sit, you can see the effects of food on consciousness a lot more clearly. And that's been a huge thing. So the meditation is like quadruple fold, you know, because then you learn to focus and become, it builds neurons in the brain for the witness observer. Mm -hmm. And then it, it takes you out of the story of your programs more you're like a witness of the programs than actually trapped and locked in the programs. And I try to tell people, they say, my cancer, my anxiety, you know, this, and I say, I tell everybody, don't say that. <laughs> it's, it's the anxiety, yes. It's yes. The cancer. You want to own that. Never. And mm -hmm. that is a, a, like, I see most people do that. And that's one of the greatest tricks in the book. It's just the body, really. Yes. It's just the body. You know, you are borrowing it from nature for a very short amount of time to travel around them, maybe have a little fun with it or whatever, take care of it, be a good steward. But it's like a little, it's like a little, you know, temple that you right. drive around in, you know? Yeah. So, so that's the main thing is the meditation. But then um, I, I'll usually get up at six. And what I've been doing is just going right from meditation into a consult because I've had so many consults, especially since I came back for a little video marathon. Is that, is that like your main gig? You got the, you got your inner circle and then your coaching clients. Um, you know, um, it's hard for me to talk about this stuff because I usually don't, but I love you, Ted, and I love everyone watching and I don't have anything to hide, but I'll tell you the truth. Um, the main thing is the elite video club yeah. and they are awesome. They are there. They're like, dude, don't worry about it. We're just here to support you. You changed our lives. Here's 39 bucks a month. You don't have to perform for us. They show up, you know, 20, 30, 40 of them show up every other weekend. I do a three hour long class and just rap. We talk about various things, but DTM never stays on the topic, you know, and then they ask a few questions and they're just there listening. And they're just very supportive and loving. And they've given me, because I went through a really hard time in 2020 and 21, because I was, wasn't was living my life. You know, the COVID came, I moved in with my girlfriend and I lost my yogi cave, which I realized is very important for me. I have to have space. I have to be doing this work. And if, I, if there's a woman there, my attention goes to her. And, um, you know, and then I just got really depressed because I wasn't listening to my heart. And then with the COVID thing at all, I got kind of stuck in all this stuff. I can't fly, I can't go anywhere and in this house. And then everyone moved to Kauai, everyone and their grandmother moved to Kauai. So there was nowhere to live. And so I just felt like it was telling me to go and I just gave all my stuff away. 
And then I, I was going to go to Idaho. I bought a little car. I saw my kids, you know, hung out with my kids. And then my ex-wife and I started arguing. Well, she started arguing. <laughs> so I said, okay, guys, I got to go. Popped in my little tin can that I bought for four grand, a little Nissan, and drove it from Idaho. I was looking at Idaho. I was like, ah, oh, this isn't really the vibe, you know? And then I went to Montana. I was like, mm, this is a little bit more rural, but maybe later on buy a cabin, you know? And on, on Montana, here. Montana looks amazing. Freedom, baby. Like I'm, I was, I was like for a while there, I was like, we got to bug out. It's like, I'm going to have to buy a bow and arrow, a gun and become a hunter. I'm out of here. I ain't taking no shots. Okay. 21 years raw vegan, you know, I'm out, I'm out of here. Give me a fishing pole. And I'm going to go survive. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Dude, I ain't getting none of that business, but now it's all chilling out. It's like, okay, there's still apples. It's all right. Calm yeah. down. Ethical vegans aren't going to kill me, but look, I'm going to survive, man. I got my balls intact and ain't nobody going to inject me with no Satan. Oops. Did I just say that? <laughs> Word. That's about it. So, so you considered a cabin in Montana. That's actually one of my dreams, dude. Getting a cabin in Montana. Is that something that you considered? Dude, I want to get a cabin in Montana on yeah. a river. Yeah, and I want to have a wood cutting business, chop wood. wood, stack wood and deliver it. Wow. I mean, because, dude, I love I used to do it when I lived out in the country for all these people. They'd be like, what can we give you some weed? You want to marry my daughter? I'd be like, no, I just love cutting wood and chopping it and stacking it. It's the most Zen thing, you know, but right now I'm very blessed and I know that like it's like the Dan is like resisting it, but it's like the God is like, get onto the camera and say stuff. And then it makes me, you know, and it's like paradigm, which we'll finish that story. It's like paradigm is kind of my second because I got in at the beginning with Lou Corona. Yeah. I actually got some bottles in my upstairs still. What, what do you got? I got the enzymes and the probiotics. Love it, dude. That's yeah. all really good stuff. And you don't want to know, the most practical thing I think for dudes like us is that protein. If you ever get a chance to try that protein, bro, what's, I love the, it. what's the base? It's pea, hemp, and goji berry protein. Wow. It's it's all whole wow. food. It's, it's just goji, goji berry protein. Yeah, which is one of the proteins that's known to produce human growth hormone in wow. the human body. So that's why. Ooh, look at those guns. I don't, I'm not really, I don't really, I'm just, I've been doing yoga and I, I hit the gym once or twice a week just to stretch and flex because yeah. too much lifting weights takes away from the meditation and there's inflammation and then you can't sit. So I have to keep all of my exercise very moderate, but that allows me to perform every day because I'm here to have fun. But I can't, I don't want to do anything to disrupt that perfect meditation pattern. And if you work out too hard or you squat too much um, or you just lift too much in your rib, mostly the legs, you'll notice. But, you know, when you lift too heavy, you get inflamed and then you can't sit as well. So all of my exercise is moderate and then I can do it every day. So we're still working on uh and I, my brain is working better because I know we're still working on how I make my money. Why do you want to know how I make my money? <laughs> how you make your money, motherfucker? Because a lot of these dudes are like, oh, Dan, you shouldn't be making all that money with the paradigm and all this stuff. It's like, listen, if you were making money, you would not be worried about how I'm making money. So go make your money. Because when you're making your money, you ain't worried about someone else is making their money. Because everybody's trying to make money except the motherfucker sitting on his mom's couch and not making no money. So <laughs> you got to ignore those people. Believe me, I had to learn that lesson the hard way, but we're working on my money, which is, yeah. I still don't know why you want to know about my money. <laughs> and I got to tell you about uh, um, a day in the life of Dan. Yeah, that's it. We're getting there, dude. Yeah, I'm telling you, though, but my, my brain cell is working after all those years, man. We are chipping away. No, I can tell you, like, one of the one of the things that people wanted to know from me the most when I started getting on YouTube and traveling is, like, Ted, how are you affording this lifestyle? How are you affording it? That's a nice way of putting it. How are you affording this lifestyle? So I told him, I was like, I've got this ebook and I've got this course and I've got this coaching program and I coach people. And then people started asking me, oh, how do I put together my ebook? How do I put together my course? How do I put together my coaching program? And I didn't want to tell them at first because I'm like, I'm just getting started with this. But they kept asking, kept asking. So then I started teaching and then they were loving it. And it was like, I'm like, wow, this is like, this actually is much more exciting to me teaching people how to start their own online business and how to turn their passion into income 
than it is for me to teach them how to peel a banana. I'm kind of over the whole peel a banana and eat it type of thing. Yeah. So, so I'm like super into uh, helping people start their online businesses. And it's cool to know. And I interviewed 12 vegan entrepreneurs about a year ago called the Plant-Based Revolution Summit. And I interviewed 12 vegan entrepreneurs. I asked them all, how do you make your money? And if someone wanted to do what you're doing, what could they do to get started? Um, and it's cool how we're all doing completely different things. There's no one size fits all. I was just throwing style. Like you said, for your coaching, you do it like every other week, which is so unique, right? Because most coaches think you need like multiple sessions a week type thing. And we doing it every other week. So I think that's really cool. Um, but but the, uh, the products, man, the, the, you, get, you get the pure dime as well. And, and so if, in, in my mind, when I, when I think of Dan, I think Dan makes his income. He's got coaching. He's got the inner or elite club. And he's got pure dime and then YouTube monetization. To me, that's like, those are like your big four, but I could be wrong. I mean, you're pretty observant. That's, that's pretty cool. And I mean, I was pretty impressed with your uh, numbers. You, you gave us some of your numbers. I was like, damn, right on, bro. That's really cool, man. Cause I'm, but you're keeping it humble. Cause you ain't, you still ain't got no suit on yet. You know, you're still got the, I got the t-shirt still. I mean, you know, we could probably go out and buy a nice clothes, but it's like, I'd rather wear no clothes. I want to take this off clothes. right now, dude. Yeah. I want to take this off. That's my, that's my feeling. But everyone's like, where's your shirt, dude, put a shirt on. Yeah. It's hard to talk about business shirtless. I can talk about raw food shirtless, but business shirtless doesn't really work. Exactly. I, I got into the habit of these nice shirts because uh, I'm always plugging the paradigm. You know what I'm trying to do, what nobody realizes what I'm doing is I'm banging it so hard because it's not for money. It's to train me to do, to be courageous because everybody has that resistance and some have it more than others of the self-worth to earn money. And you have this thing, right? But then you have the resistance and some people have no resistance to making money. Some people have a lot. And then some people are more like me. They have a lot of resistance, but they also have a lot of skills and a lot of talent and they've developed a lot on top of the unconscious blueprint of not worth money so it's it, it, life is like a tug of war at least my experience so i'm trying to untie the knots so i really plug the paradigm because i don't know if people can even imagine this you know but it's like god is telling me that i work for paradigm because i've been resisting it resisting it resisting it because you know you don't really want to be schlepping anything but here's the thing, the pharmaceutical companies sell their pills, they make trillions of dollars and nobody gets any benefit from it whatsoever. Maybe a few people stay alive a little bit longer and they're all propped up with their thyroid medication and stuff like that, but they don't really get to the root of anything. Yeah. you know. And so what we're doing with herbs and superfoods is we are actually helping people to have a lifestyle that they can work their way out of sickness and disease. Almost everyone is like sick these days, you know? It's pretty weird, like my friends and stuff, and they should know better, but they're off the rails, you know, and they're going through the holidays and they're chomping down on all this, you know, stuff that is more mucus forming and they're not caring for their gut and their lymphatic system. And so that's gonna be the metabolic residues that I've just paid attention to because that's, that's step one. Then the other work is the hardcore, you know, just staying fit and healthy and hydrated. And then I'm also doing this other work, which is the consciousness, untying the knots of consciousness, freeing myself from the prison of the mind and the programs and the society. And then also I'm doing this really hardcore uh, body work, which is the reason why I'm here with my best friend, he is the master at breaking up all the ossified tissues that carry a frequency of low self-worth because when you have low self-worth, only then do you do the drugs and the cocaine and the meth and the heroin and the weed and the alcohol and the cigarettes and the painkillers and eat the crappy food. But if you had, if you, if you had an energy that you cared for yourself, you would never do that. So then you snort it, smoke it, drink it, eat it. And then you be, you get those calcareous deposits all through the body, the residues of synthetics coming all the way from uh, 
drugs during childbirth, well baby visits, you know, uh, intramuscular infusions for, you know, the little children now more and more these days with aluminum and mercury and 180 other isolated synthetics. And so it's the isolated synthetics. And if you're, a, I was really hardcore. And I try not to make it sound like it's really cool to be a drug addict. I was just, I was really lost and I was born into that world. And I was a pothead at four years old. I was like, daddy, give me a toke. You know what I mean? Serious? Like, yeah. Dude, my brother's over there in the corner working on another box of saltines at six. And I'm over there, daddy, daddy, give me another toke, you know? Oh, so, yeah. And so then by the time I'm like eight, I'm stealing my dad's weed and rolling it up on the Bible and out selling joints to my friends. So I'm like a weed dealer at eight years old, you know what I mean? And so by the time I was 14, I'm like pack a day, alcoholic, pothead, you know, and getting blowjobs from the girls in the neighborhood, you know? So I kind of started off, it's like a funky ass world, you know what I'm saying? Like we are on a low vibration in some of these hoods, you know? And to crawl on out of that through this process, it's really, I'm really, really grateful. But then when people are like, why are you angry? Why aren't you perfect like blue? Why aren't you all this and that? It's like, listen, I'm just me, man. So, they don't know the origin. Yeah. They don't know the origin. So, so how do we go? How do we go from being a 14 year old drug dealer player to washing windows and how do we go from washing windows to raw foods what, what's that journey like uh okay so i was uh I, I when i was 16 i my parents moved to the country to get away from the drugs well what they didn't know was that you go from the city with certain kind of drugs then you go to the country and there's just other kinds of drugs and a lot more of them. <laughs> but I didn't know that because I was in a gang and I stayed with, my, I wanted to stay with my gang. So I slept in a paper box while my whole family moved down to the country. I did not want to leave my friends. What's a paper box? A, where they put the papers. And so you'll find out if it's cold and you put your, wrap up yourself with the newspapers, you know? Um, not the recycled ones, but the brand new ones. And so papers actually hold a lot of heat. So they'd be all warm coming off the paper mill, all these big fat stacks of papers. And then you just crawl under a couple bundles and you can just, you know, survive. Like on the street? Yeah, which I did for like a month. And then I was like, okay, this is not working. I am not getting my anything together here. And besides... These guys, I had, there was a gang fight. One of my friends got his head split open with a two by four, all for a sack of weed. An ounce of weed, and, and they could have said, give us the ounce of weed. We would have gave it to them because we had garbage sacks full of weed, man. We would have just gave them the weed, but these guys, they just... So that was kind of the last straw. Then I was like, I'm out of this life. I got out of there. My friend standing next to me, was it was either him or me, and he got his head split open. I jumped, ran. I was, oh, Jesus has got my back, okay? Because I should be dead many times over from all the things that I did or in prison or whatever. But I made it through all that because I did have Jesus, you know? From four years old, that was my first experience. Jesus came into my heart from Ernie and Bert on the puppet bus. That's my very first experience. And then Jesus kept me, protected me, the light of Christ, the light of Christ consciousness within myself knowing when to duck, when to move, when to leave, when to not walk down that alley, you know, when to not drive when I'm drunk, even though I did drive drunk many, many times, you know, one eye closed, driving down the center line, you know, like I did a lot of weird stuff, but my parents moved to the country. Then I uh, actually uh, didn't go, but then I was like, okay, after that gang fight and that happened, I kind of got scared. I was, it was reality check. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna go home and live with my parents. So I went home, went back into school. There was a school there about from kindergarten through 12th grade, there were 60 kids. So I had one girl to choose from, except in the grade below me, all the 14 year olds, I was 16. They were all 14. There was like seven of them. And their dads were like, uh oh, here's this guy. Same old green hat, I remember, tip to the side, little gangster. And they were like, uh oh, this guy's gonna get one of our daughters pregnant or all of them, <laughs> you know? And so then they were like, we gotta get this guy out of here. 
because he's this little gangster coming from the city and there was all those drugs. Now there's just all these other drugs. So my parents, they didn't really, my dad should have known better because he was a hippie and he had been to North River, Brooklyn, uh, North River Valley. And he should have known that there was a lot more other kinds of drugs. And so then nothing changed there. What was the, what was the difference in drugs? Like what, what the city was like weed and what, and what was the country? I mean, really, it's actually, it was the same. It was the people were different and the way they used them. Okay. Actually, and, 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 so and, 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 and the drugs we're talking about, is this cocaine, weed, or are we talking LSD or what? Uh, you know, more so, actually, to tell you the truth, it's, it was all the same. It was LSD, mushrooms. Well, no, it was LSD in the city. And then it was mushrooms in the country because we lived on a cow pasture and that's where the mushrooms grow and it's one for the bag one for me one mm. for the bag one for me and then you're just, just tripping balls so different kinds of drugs now weed is the universal one but when when you move from the city it's like oh you got your little dusty ass mexi weed and then you go down here to the hippies and they're like hey man you got here's the fucking you know and then we're smoking a joint playing music you know i was living in a barn that's another part of the story. But this joint is going around. It's like six hours later, you're pied stoned out of your mind. You're like, this thing's still going? <laughs> Holy shit, you know? They, they would roll the fattest joints, the fattest buds, the biggest sacks of weed. So my parents, they didn't really make a real good move there. But the air was fresh. And I, I did, so I, I got kicked out of school because the dad's, talk to the principal, the principal, if you screw up one more time, it's like, if I screw up one more time, so the next day I screwed up, I mean, I was a screw up. So they knew it was gonna happen, they kicked me out. Then I went, and then what happened is the final fight with my dad, the final time that my you dad- You remember, sorry, do you remember why you got kicked out? What was the reason, what was the screw up? If you can remember, you're probably maybe too high, I don't know. Well, that's the thing, I mean, there was this one time I did get real high, paranoid. I would get stoned every day, but this one time I got real paranoid because I smoked this like pine cone bud with Guy Kobe. And Jeremy remembers that. We all remember that day. And the problem was, was probably that it was the, probably the aluminum we smoked on the tin can, but it was this, it was a demon bud. It looked like a demon. And he put it on the can and we, I just took a couple of hits and then boom, I was so paranoid. But I don't think that was it. It was something else like, I can't remember what it was that actually the final thing that got me kicked out, but it, I don't think it really mattered. The exact detail there is pretty interesting. I'm not trying to think about that, but, but uh, anyways, they kicked me out. And so then, then it wasn't, it was unrelated, but my dad had some anger issues and I had been there living there for maybe six months or something. And finally, my dad was just pissed. I don't know what it was, but he, he punched me one last time and threw me outside in the snow. And I had a towel on, I just got out of the shower. I think it was because I didn't do the dishes or something. And my dad knocked the wind out of me. And so ooh, I couldn't breathe, he threw me outside. Then my stepmom let me back in about a half an hour later freezing. She's like, you can't do this, he's freezing, you know? And then I just walked right up to my dad and I said, dude, if you ever hit me again, I'm gonna knock you the fuck out. And that was the last time he ever hit me at 16 years old, but I also got kicked out of the house. So that's when I went to go live in the barn and that's where I lived on a horse farm. Now it was a horse farm, but actually it was like the, the bud farm. Right. Now with the principles of the weed, there was vegetables, carrots like this, beets oh. like this, cabbages, ducks, chickens, um, and horses. And but it was the buds that was the real deal and so there was music and hippies and um i was just working i kind of learned how to work on a farm a little bit do some gardening take care of animals and stuff but i wasn't really very good at it and i wasn't very focused and so that only lasted a few months then i went to go live in a cabin in the woods and then my friend burned the cabin down because his girlfriend broke up with him and there was a picture i said jeremy you just burned our house down bro you know so now we're homeless again 
and hell, I don't even know what I did after that, but I moved into the town eventually, Aberdeen, I think at about 17 or something. And um, I got a job at uh, the mill and that's when the meth began, no the major way. meth. Yeah, because the, our, we thought our boss was doing like cross tops, right? But no, it was so he, we said, hey, we wanna stay awake, you know, so we can work more. And then finally we all went in there, me and my two buddies that worked at this mill and my girlfriend too, who eventually, she was like, this is a dead end and she quit and she broke up with me and that's what broke my heart. But then the, uh, we got high on that meth and we listened to, um, oh, Shaka Khan over and over again. But I did, I was a Sawyer. A wood sawyer. I, I saw. How long does the how long does the high last? A meth. Um, the first one, many many hours. It was a little tiny bump, but it was enough. Is all it took. And I already had that in my system from birth. Oh, yeah. I was already introduced to amphetamines. It was already in my system. It's what's interesting is if whenever I did cocaine, is I would feel normal. So I know my brain is really wacky. But the meth, that would keep you up. And then you would take stuff apart and it turns you into a total tweaker and you're just a weirdo. Take stuff apart and you're like sitting on the middle of a chair at night, spraying cockroaches on the wall, big bug eyed craziness. Uh, it's amazing I survived that, but it explains a lot. It's like, oh, no wonder this guy's like, you know, got a screw loose, right? And so I have a great excuse, but um, that's where that started was the meth at that time and then we really all got into it i was a meth addict for a few years wow. and then slowly i got off of it oh man i stayed up for a month one time i was crazy dude but you would just you because i would have it was so cheap and it was so easy to get and there's so many different colors and kinds and if you got the good stuff you buy it all if you got the really good golden stuff you know, that was really like, would just, you could, you'd really feel it. Some of the other stuff was cheaper and more watered down and stuff, but it was a very prevalent in that town. Kirk Cobain, Grays Harbor, old logging town, no jobs, no nothing, depressed economy, um, lower vibration of people, not, 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 not in a negative way, but just salt of the earth you know, fish, you know, the swans man delivers your food, go to Costco, you know, live out in the country, old loggers, you know, and it's the logging industry is no more, but the people are still there and there's just no more jobs really. So there was what, a, because what, they cut all the trees down? It just got to the point where a lot of it was so much more automated and yes, it all, all had been, you know, cut. And then it was on, some of it was on third growth and so you get these little pecker poles and you just still making paper products. And I still had a job at a mill. Yeah. So I worked at this, at the a cedar mill and I cut the shims and ridge and I was a sawyer. So I made good money and would work, we would work like 16 hours a day because we were meth heads. I mean, what are you going to do? You just want to work. That's what meth heads do. The, the, the smart ones, they do meth and they work, you know? I did. I took uh, I took Adderall once or Dexedrine once, which is like a meth basically for ADD. And I remember taking it and feeling like this is the ultimate work drug. If I was a soldier in the army, I'd be the best soldier. If I was a student, I'd be the best student. If I was an entrepreneur, I'd be the best entrepreneur. All you want to do is work. There's nothing else but work. Well, for a few days or well, a week or two. Uh, well, no, I mean like for for a few until the high lot till the high wears off, right? Yeah, and then you got to take two, and then yeah. you got to take four. Oh, but the come down was unbelievably bad. Is the come down super bad on meth? Oh, <laughs> I'm still coming down, bro. It's been twenty something years. It's like hell, eh? It's it really is. But it's what's cool about it is that you get better. It, that's why it's easier for me to fast because I like oh pain, nah. discomfort, yeah, whatever. I felt a lot worse. So it's like here I am. I'm a little weak. Right. whatever it's like no big deal i mean when you're coming down off these all the god and now that's the work that i'm doing with the body work one piece at a time my friend tavis he'll work on this much for four hours on a just he'll work on just like this much 
and he'll just scrape it. He does like surgery. And he was working on here a couple of weeks ago. And right when it broke loose, one of the layers, the tears came out of my eyes. And at the exact moment he said, you know, oh, we just got through another layer, cool. At the exact same moment. So it happens simultaneously. So we're breaking through these layers. And what I'm doing is staying on the clean, clean diet, hydration, yoga, fitness, no stress, no drama, because I can't have any stress if I'm gonna go through this process. But that is what happens for all the people that did drugs and um, you know synthetics and injections. Everyone responds differently. Some people have a lot higher glutathione yeah. and better detoxification pathways. I don't, me, in my family, we don't really have that. So I have to work a lot harder than the average person. You know, kidneys are kind of an issue in my family and uh, the dopamine and the serotonin, I'm really working on the endocannabinoid system, which I fried with weed and drugs. It takes a long time. So I'm on the path of regeneration and I don't expect anyone to understand this because this is a compilation of Arnold Eret and Hilton Otima and talking to Lou and talking to Tavis and we're talking to Dr. Robert Morse and reading hundreds of books and thousands of videos and trying to like, like what's wrong with me? Cause I've had inflammation. You know, I'm an Aries, so we're all cerebral. And I remember the jab, it just, they, I got the ADD and that's where they start with the Adderall and the Ritalin because they, what it is is immunoexcitotoxicity or, you know, brain inflammation or nerve irritation because the chemicals in those solutions sink into the blood brain barrier and get to places they're not supposed to be. So the immune system is on hyperdrive and the uh, nervous system is irritated by the presence of those uh, isolated chemical substances that are recognized as non-self. So the immune system is always attacking right. it. So they call it autoimmune disease but it's really not autoimmune disease. The doctors just don't know that, hey, dummy, you're the one that injected me with this stuff 30 years ago. And now it's starting to manifest as a chronic condition instead of an acute condition in the kids with ADD, irritation, inflammation, inability to pay attention and just and, and uh, irritated, uh, ill at ease nervous system. So I'm trying to get my nervous system back and get my heart to open. And so it's just this, it's a real work to me. And that's why you can see why someone like me might not just jump out to YouTube and, and celebrate it so much. Cause like, well, you're kind of weird and unique. We're well, not, everyone needs to do that or they're not as aware. Like you could fake it all day. You could fake it on here. You got your lighting and everything else. And you could say all the right things. But can you really be real? And does it really matter? Like this really matters to me. Like I pray every day for help from the most high because I want to just feel better. I feel really, really well. But I know that there's more. And I've had this thing up here. It's, it's like a low grade inflammation, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then there's that pain body demon of low self-worth that will literally say, you are not going to succeed. I will not let you, you are not lovable. You'll never fall in love, blah, blah, blah. It's really a, a weird thing, but I hope to break through that, which I think is associated with those deposits because those deposits are the drugs to suppress the not good enough. I'm not good enough. Let's get high and at least feel good enough for a little while. Then you got to pay all that debt. So that's what I'm doing now in my life is paying my debt. And that's why I say like the crazy man, hey, if I could go back and do it all over again, I wouldn't touch a cigarette, a drop of alcohol, none of it, you know? Love I would it. be sober, I'd be celibate until I found the one woman, I'd make a couple of perfect babies. I'd have my you got shit- a, You got up. a couple of perfect babies, dude. I mean, I, I actually do, yeah. I just wasn't ready, you know? I wasn't, um, you know, we're, we're working it out now, but see, I passed the pain body onto them. Thankfully, I never hit my kids. 
never yelled at him except one time I yelled at Natea, but that was like about six months ago because <laughs> she was mad as hell because I stopped the child support, you know, but we're working that out now, you know. What do they think of their dad? I think that they, they think he's cool. I, I think they wish I would have been able to be there, but I don't think that they um, are aware of the dynamic between the, the mom and I. I'll take, I'll take my half of the responsibility for sure. But, you know, you can't take full, you know, but we just didn't, it didn't, you know, she was a, a quite a bit older than I, I was. I'm like a breeding stallion. And, um, you know, so she, her clock was ticking. Here I am young, dumb and full of, you know what? And so, I mean, I really love my kids. They're very, very special. I just wish, I wish I could have done a better job. And I kind of knew intuitively that I wasn't really ready to do a good job. I think I could do a much better job now, but what I don't, what I want to do is clear this debris away. And I believe that I finally learned enough because I've been on this journey, but then th this distraction and that distraction, and this distraction and YouTube and girls and money and fame and, you know, it sucks your head up and then you get off track. And then when you get back on track, you're like, okay, this is my priority. I'll make enough money to pay my rent, but I'm going to focus on this. I have one thing. That's what I'm doing. And that's my advice to everyone is pick one thing and do it because everything else will resolve itself around that. That one thing is, is life regeneration. To, you know, to oversimplify. Yeah. I could sit here and give you a 20 minute dissertation on yeah. what exactly that looks but like. But if we but were to oversimplify to be life regeneration? Yeah, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual regeneration. It's super dope eliminate. because you've picked that one thing, right? When you created the brand name Life Regenerator, like you are the life regenerator, man. Like but what's totally crazy is I had I had never made a video. I never thought about videos. I didn't know what videos were. I didn't even know what YouTube was. I met Krista at a David Wolf retreat. And then I went over to New York and she had a desktop. And um, then I was like, okay, how am I going to watch? You know, back then I remember every thing you clicked on led back to porn. That's how it was back then. It was maybe that was just me actually, but it seemed like at every time you were you clicking the on, back, you were clicking the back button. <laughs> there was, it was, it was 2007. And I had no idea, but I had at the time, we, Krista and I went down to Florida to meet Robert Morse at his first uh, detox school. And there was like 12 people there or something. And so I just picked Life Regenerator, not having any idea about branding. I have done a terrible job at branding, terrible at YouTube, terrible at social media. I've hired some people, but it just made it worse. And I wasn't ready. And I don't know if it's my destiny or not. Cause I, I just, I think maybe later, but there's this thing I want to complete this. I call it the complete healing, you know? And for 21 years, I learned about it from the Essene gospel of peace, fast and pray until the Lord of the house returns. And I made it 40 days. And I had just gotten to the, what I call the trauma ball or the anger ball, because I was like on day 38, I think, or 39. And I was like, why am I so angry? I'm this toothpick, 128 pound toothpick, you know, sallow, you know, and I'm angry. And then I reached down and I go, and I pushed on the little ball. And I was like, and it was just this wave of anger. So then from that time on, I called it the, the anger ball. Or, it, and, and later on, I kind of termed it the trauma ball, you know, that my, the little boy just stuffed it all in there. And it's, he's frustrated. Yeah. And he's still working at it. And it's, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say embarrassing, but I think that I wear my heart on my sleeve. And I, I bet you peep, there's more people struggling than what they want to admit, especially in today's modern social media where everything is butterflies and rainbows and spirituality is this wonderfully perfect ever flowing uh you know rainbows skittles and butterflies floating 
but true spirituality is really like, wow, I'm a dick, you know, I really need to change, or I'm greedy, or I'm selfish, or I'm impatient, or I'm angry. And, you know, that's real, true releasing, because mm. my philosophy is that the light, the love, the peace, the abundance, the faith, it's already there. It's like a quality within the field of divinity itself that's already in all of us simply blocked out by the like the software i mean the hardware it's like a perfect computer no problems it's just it's all there you know it's empty space filled with those divine qualities but then into the hardware is plugged this software from religion and you know school and your parents mostly your parents and your family life what you observe and feel and from utero on, all the way through everything that you observe, and then the, the base of the subconscious is built yeah. through those observations and experiences, you know, yeah. we're unraveling that, clearing away and peeling away the onion to get to the self, capital S, or to get to the absolute, even prior to the I am, because there's this I am, I am this, I am that, I am a man. I am six foot two, I weigh 162 pounds, I am hungry, I am this, I am that, I am that. But prior to the I am consciousness is that absolute. And that I feel like is where the peace, eternal peace, the peace that passes, path, passeth. I, I have always have a hard time saying that. The peace that pathless passes whatever. Passes? Understood. What word are you trying to say? The peace that passeth. You know, it's, uh, back in the Bible days. Got it, got it. To where you, it's like you, it's peace that's not understandable by the linear mind. And I think our minds get in the way yeah. of the realization. And that's why the meditation and the concentration and that hour of the day. And then you try to carry that through the rest of the day, that inward focus and that anchoring into the absolute self which is prior to all thoughts and concepts that's the real you and that real me the real absolute is the real absolute in you and it's just one homogenous god being as it is and then so we don't really have to fight anymore you know but we're still gonna fight so let's do it <laughs> so you <laughs> so you you have this morning routine where you wake up you do your meditation and then you'll do your consult with someone. And then do you have a time of the day that you prefer to break your fast? Or is it whenever you feel like it? Um, what I do is I, uh, I, I meditate. And then I do the consult at six. And the reason why I do that, I learned it real quick. If I do a consult at six, I'm usually done. It's supposed to be an hour. But I really give 90 minutes. And sometimes it's a little more. You know, and some people are very respectful. They're like, Dan, I don't want to take up any more of your time. The hour's up. I could, we could keep going. And I'm like, don't worry about it. If I'm working with somebody and, you know, we're getting closer, it usually takes about 45 minutes to kind of, oh, it's you, you haven't processed your mother's death or you hate your job or, oh, you jerk off every day. You know, you find out what it is that they're doing that's, you know, because everyone is always like, what do I eat? And it's like, hold on a minute. What's the real problem here? You know. So, so, so they come to you for nutrition advice usually, but then they end up usually getting like life advice. Yeah, I think that my videos don't always display. I mean, because I've been through a lot, and so I, I have, and I've consulted with thousands of people. So you get pretty damn good at it. You get good at asking questions and getting a sense. And, and there is dietary advice, but there's always, I'm looking for those uh, underpinnings. You know, right. why are you eating junk food? Why are you a hundred pounds overweight? What's really going on? Oh, we were abused as a child. So it's the real thing. And the food thing is amazing, dude. I mean, I love it. You know it. I mean, it's the food thing is amazing. It's not the be all end all. It's one wedge of the pie, but it has to be good. Otherwise, that spoke is short and the ride is clunky. Yeah. But the finances have to be there, you know, the relationships, the sleep, 
however you however many wedges you have in your pie they all have to be equal so that yeah. the wheel turns so at, at about 90 minutes i'm pretty much trying to wrap up around 75 80 minutes and then i try to start kind of cleaning it up so that it doesn't go past 90. Right. then i'll go hop and take a shower and then i blast off to hot yoga which mm. is my daily practice so i run on out to uh this cool place and do do hot yoga pretty much i would say five or six days a week you know some days a, a consult will run over or the class is full or you know whatever but pretty much every day i've kind of got addicted to it but it's really the way to i mean yeah. you just if you do hot yoga for 90 minutes every day you just you'll, you will not get sick i mean i mean you can't say that but it's part of a program of a mucusless diet a hydration mm. Diet. And so what I do is I start my hydration in the class. I have my little, um, can't see it from here, but I have my little cooler and I have my distilled water and I'll drink 32 ounces there. Yeah, exactly. 32 ounces of distilled water. Distilled, nice baby. Bag of ice. Do you add anything to the distilled? Do you quote unquote structure it or just pure distilled? Um, I put it on a key code, you know, which is sacred geometry. So that's step one. Um, sometimes I'll just add a little lemon drop of orange, but usually I just drink plain distilled water after the key code has structured it with that consciousness. Cool. Um, another secret is sometimes I'll put a, uh -oh, uh oh, look out. I put a drop, a dollop of honey in there, stir that up. Oh, Ted is, uh, he's, he's mad. I, got, I can't upload this video. We're done. We're out. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I remember I remember you said something back in the day about so you just talked about how you put the water on this on this um, sacred geometry and that will do its thing. I also remember you saying something when back in the day. I don't know if you ever remember saying this, but you definitely did. You're like you would um, let I think it was Stephen Hawking. Is it Stephen Hawking? Is that his name? The oh, author? Dr. Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins. Probably Dr. Hawkins. Yeah, the guy who's got the book called. Um, yeah, power versus force. Power versus now, yeah. You would just leave him running. You let the audio run in the room. You'd leave, come back, just so that that room was full of his vibe cool. and it would soak into the walls. And that's what I do everywhere I go. I listen to Dhammapada by the Buddha over and over again. I listen to Ramana Maharshi. I listen to Nisargadatta Maharaj, Vivekananda, Sivananda. Um, and of course, sad guru for a more contemporary, uh, modern view. I like the old school yogis because they're just like, this is what you do. Do it. You know, quit wasting time. You know, and you'll just let them saturate the walls. I let them saturate my consciousness. That's what I do uh, when I go to bed hmm. and when I wake up. Now, I've been more so doing those consults at six because normally what I would do is meditate. Then I'd kind of lay back down. And I would play some audio. And so I do that if I don't have a consult, but I've been inundated. Right. So this is my kind of my most recent routine. Yeah. I found that if I do the consult at six, that's out of the way. And I just do like one a day. Sometimes I'll do two or three if I have to later on in the day. But then I go to the yoga class because that's very important. Something about the yoga every day. It just really gets everything activated, opened up, stretched out, sweated Plus, out. You must feel like you're progressing in that yoga, right? Like you must feel like you're getting these centimeter gains. Most definitely. It's a little bit um, methodical, robotic. Um, I have done, when I was in Kauai and would go to waves yoga, Lulu would mix it up. So you'd have, a, but this, they do the same thing over and over. Then there's another girl that if I go to the afternoon class, which I do, sometimes I'll do two yogas in a day. There's another girl that mixes it up a bit. She's more of a true yogi and she does other different stuff. But this mixed class, it's very robotic. So you can gauge your progress with balance, symmetry, focus. Some days you're more focused on your mat than others. Sometimes you're just looking at the girl's butt in front of you and you're like, oh my God, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. You can't focus. I know my, if I had a name, it'd be called Yogi Perv, you know, but it's, it's my only social life is to go there and be around other yogis. And usually it's about 90, 95% women. Maybe it's that's, maybe, maybe, that, joke, but maybe that's why you don't get sick. What's that? Maybe that's why you don't get sick. 
Well, it's part of the motivation too. I just think that women that do yoga are just special, whether they're just doing asana or they're actually true yogis, you know, in the sense of seeking for that union. Yeah. Um, more so than maybe like gym girls, but either way, healthy women are awesome and all women are awesome. And I don't care what anyone does. I will treat them with love and respect. I'll literally feed anyone, anything they want. I'll go buy a pan and I will cook you. If you're, if my daughters came and they wanted pizza or if they wanted a piece of chicken, or if I had a guest, I will do, I'll do whatever anyone wants. I don't care. I don't have any pans. I've never used that stove, but I'm that's, that's my rule. Wow. Everyone will eat what they want, exactly what they want. They will not be affected and they will not feel guilty because of what I do. They will be happy and satisfied and I will make it for them and I will buy it for them because food is important and everyone needs to be comfortable with what they eat. Yeah. And that's a side of me that most people don't really know. But when I would go, I was doing, the, when I did church food for years, I would do half cooked vegan, half raw. I remember that. Yeah. And sometimes I'd get requests for fish and I was kind of like, well, you know, but I just never did do that, but I'm the kind of guy that would, I never needed to, you know, yeah. everyone was very satisfied with the cooked vegan and they would do, they probably would. And, and there were times I did fully raw too. And they were satisfied with that, you know, and they loved it. I would spend, uh -huh. you know, probably six or eight hours a week preparing all this food. It started out at 35 people. Who paid for the food? I did. Wow. And, and then um, my friend Preston, who was the leader or was kind of the manager of Hale Ohana, where it started and built up for two years, he was like, okay, he was hooking me up because he saw I was spending about three, four or 500 bucks a week of my own money. That was where all my money went was to feed the people, but I loved it. It was feeding people to me is the best thing ever. I just don't want to own a restaurant. But then I would go there and make the food and play the music. And I just had a community and I was very, very happy. But then COVID came and wiped that all away. So eventually there was, usually I would get my money back. And then Michael started going around with a jar. And he's like, listen, man, come on, you cheap asses. I didn't care though. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I was happy and I believe that you know, the universe took care of me, God, when I was generous like that, I would have these boons from YouTube or people or retreats. And it just took care of me, you know, I bet, you know, three or about five or six or seven years ago, I did a lot better. I'd have $3,500 in the, you know, for the Google AdSense and the enzymes were off the hook. And, you know, when I had like two, three, 400 subscribers a day, but then Google got bought off by Alphabet and Alphabet is a pharmaceutical company or owns a couple of pharmaceutical companies. Then they started healthy people up, 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 down in the algorithms. And ever since then, like I've had no subscribers when for years, for, for years and years, two, three, four, 500 subscribers a day, every day, even when I stopped for six months, I would still get two or 300 subscribers a day. And then finally that just stopped. They leveled me off at 371. And I haven't now, every time I make a video, I lose subscribers and I lose money. It's weird. My Google AdSense goes down. It's like, wait a minute, what the hell's going on here? But I'm actually having fun again. And I see Dude. that the, the, the consults are a, a good part of it. We haven't finished that part of it yet, but. Yeah, let me hop in there for a sec because I tell all my clients, I'm like, don't turn your ads on because your video should be the ad for the thing that you want to offer people. And if you have ads on your video, then people are going to watch your video and click off and go buy something else when they could be watching you and then buying what you have to offer. So I tell all my clients to turn that shit off and just tell people, link in description, get my thing. Because if an ad pops up, now they're gone. I don't want anybody gone. I want everybody on my video. Don't leave. Don't click on that and give me a couple cents. I don't care about a couple cents. I want you to spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars with me via link in description. And, and if I had a different model, I think that would be sage advice. Yeah. But I have like the super ghetto, you know, evergreen model. 
And, you know, so you have what I call skills. Okay. I do not, <laughs> I, I have Ricky, but he's his own thing. So I don't really, I never figured all that business stuff out. I should probably get some coaching with you because I really do want to do better, but here's the thing. I want everyone to know this. I'm going to look into the camera now, but I want to work on this one. So my little YouTube thing, I just do enough just to get enough. And, you know, if, if that's not cool, then, you know, please forgive me, but I need to focus on this one someday, maybe in a couple of years or three years or five years, I'll kind of maybe have gone through the process. And then I can, like I said, like Dr. Burgett or um, medical medium it to where you've got people working for you and it's all organized and someone tells me what to say, you know, which will ruin my brand, of course, but just, you know, uh, it's just that I'm so disorganized only because I, 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 I hate to say it or admit it, but I do the minimum that I need to do to get what I need to do what really matters to me behind the scenes, which is to develop myself as a human being. So I spend a lot of time, you know, I try to keep a balanced life. This YouTube and social media thing can just dry you out and suck you dry. If you don't stay on point and set up boundaries, you cannot answer every email, especially if you're at my level. And then people are like, you're a dick on Facebook, you know, four years later, you're a dick. You didn't answer my questions. You're like, oh my God. You know, it's like, you don't, you ain't me, man. So I've had to set up a lot of boundaries. And when people pay, you know it, when people pay, you get right back to them. You put them on the schedule. You call right on time. Yeah. I might have missed one or two consults in five years. I mean, so there's the business, Dan, you know, the guy that, you know, that learned how to do business from a very young age. And I've been working for myself ever since, but I never did figure out the technology. And I didn't, almost in a way, I didn't want to because I wanted to figure out this technology. So that's what kind of sets me apart. Maybe I don't have all the bells and whistles, but the real truth is, is that when this energy emanates, people can feel it because it's real, because he's really doing the work. He's not just talking about it or read a bunch of books and is thinking from a, from a linear perspective. I'm on the track. And that's the energy that transmits that someday, if there is that methodical, you know, structure of funnels and, you know, you know, getting them on the back end and I now mean, you know, I could do, yeah, I could do like retreats. I have, that's what I'm going to do here, you know, and I could probably charge five grand or more a week, you know, and that'd be kind of ideal too. So let's see how it all goes. But, you know, um, right now I, I have done the minimum and I haven't invested my time and energy in how to do this on YouTube, how to get more traffic, how to we, do this. We are three, maybe four, five hours max away from you having something completely different set up something very nice easy to run and highly profitable it's like it's very it's very similar to health in a way like someone's like oh why am i struggling with health why am i struggling with health and you're and you know if you could just work with them for three four five hours on their diet their fitness their lifestyle habits mm. everything would change for them it's like that in business too. I see a lot of people struggling in business and I'm like, you don't need to be struggling. You're so close. You're like a couple documentaries away, you know? Um, and with business, it's like a couple small tweaks, a couple different links here. And it's like, your things are very different. So let's definitely talk about that at another time, but. Um, I think that's a great idea. Um, but, but, you, but. You consulting? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll hook you up. Don't worry. <laughs> let's, uh, let's get back to the day in life. Let's finish this day in life. We're going to get to it. Here we go. So by now, We've master by now we finished yoga, I think. And now it's like what 10 noon? Uh, I, I, yoga is over at 9 45. And then I come and I drop by the river, and it's an ice cold bath. Mm. So I go from the hot yoga to the ice cold river. Sweet man. And I just, you know, hopefully no one's seen me naked yet, you know. Um, so I, I just, have. Um, well, I just mean uh, from the uh, <laughs> at the river. I don't want to freak anybody out walking by, but I usually it's still early enough in the morning and it's a real kind of an isolated place, but there is a trail that goes through there. 
but I just pull up on the road, kind of hike down a little bit, hop into the river and just get that cold dip, you know? And then now my day is ready to start. Wow. And then this is where it opens up a bit. This is where it could be a uh, Zoom call with somebody or a call an old friend or make a couple YouTube videos or mm. go shopping and make juice for the next couple of days or make some coconut almond yogurt. Um, but also within the, the day, there's usually some kind of, it inter, it's intermittent between hiking, biking, um, sunbathing um, out in the desert on the rock, um, or maybe I'll drive to Sedona, maybe once a week, do a little shopping. I have a couple friends over there. So after, after yoga, it depends. I, I might do another console. That's kind of my, basically from like around um, 10 or, or, or 10 or 10, 30 or 11, I might come back here, take a hot bath, essential oils or something, depending on, is it cold? Is it snowy? So basically from like 10 onwards, but the, you were interested in when I break the fast. And that is usually after I get home from yoga. So that will be usually my first meal is somewhere between 10 and noon. And it's, know? and it's usually juice or something juicy. It's, I mean, 95% of the time it is juice. I'm mm. a juice addict. I live on juice. Um, I don't know if I'm healthy or not, but I seem to be doing all right. I just, I don't need that much food. I, I love the glucose and I love the hydration. My body's so efficient um, and I'm not a huge, I, I am, you know, sort of athletic. I'll ride maybe on my bike. Dude, you I go got, to cross America, dude. Well, I mean, so, but, but right now, you know, it's more of the moderation. I'll probably do five, eight, maybe 10 miles on the bike. Just simple, couple hours, go out there. I did it yesterday and made a video. I ride my bike out to the middle of the desert. I picked, I worked out with rocks and, and some logs and I made a video and, um, and then I rode home, you know, and, but actually I sat in the sun on a rock talking to a friend for like two hours. I had service out there and she called me. We haven't talked in, a, in about a year. She was kind of a little, an amazing love affair actually. You know, um, one of the coolest people ever that taught me so much stuff about how awesome relationships can be. But then again, what happens is, is this thing won't open up. And I'm, that's the biggest thing I'm working on is get this open. you are worthy of love. You can open up. Do not be afraid. You know, so I know I talk a big game about love and stuff <laughs> I have for years. Right. But it's like but that's but you talk about what you want. I learn more myself from my own videos than anyone else you know i do what he says you know he channels the highest and then he does it you know you rap dude you freestyle so hard like uh i don't know if that's upbringing being with a gang or whatever but when you talk you just rap you know it's poetry man like it's so easy to listen to you for 30 45 minutes i don't even know what you're saying but it sounds good you know like it's just, it just sounds good you just rap I don't get it either, bro. I don't know what it is. It's like you, you turn, you should know this as a, as an entrepreneur, you turn your craziness into, you know, an income that's, it's kind of cheesy, but it's just, it is fun. Cause what I'm doing is I'm thinking and I'm just channeling the best and that fills us up. And then, you know, it's just when we're doing our work, it's kind of like there's a guy and he's got arthritis, right? He's like 74 years old and he's got arthritis and he's in his wheelchair, but then you prop him up and you put him at the piano and then all of a sudden, da -da 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 you know what I mean? And he starts channeling and all his problems go away. And that's true for so many different things. The cheerleader, the news media person, you know, uh, the entrepreneur, the video maker, yeah. And so, and then it's sort of like sad guru. And then what you do is you figure it out. You're like, wait a minute, when I'm doing this, when I'm chopping wood or when I'm working with dogs or when I'm, you know, writing, whatever your deal is, that is of service, your karma yoga, 
That's when you're channeling your highest self. That's when you're the happiest. That's when it's flowing through you. And that's where you want to be. And if we can find that, we be, become very productive. Yeah. And so what the, the only thing with this was that the, the, the haters hitting me in my soft spots because there's that little boy in there that, see, they are the reflection of what's going on inside of me. They are so you. They yeah. are. And I know that. And so I, I, I've learned to start appreciating them. At first, you're a little more ego. You're a little more defensive. You want, hey, understand me. I would never do that to you because right. I'm not the type of guy that's going to go around and like, you're fat, you're dumb. You're, you're, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to say your diet is slop or I'm not going to, I mean, maybe I have and I'm not perfect, but I try not to make a habit in any way, shape, or form of, putting people down, being negative. You know, if you don't have something nice to say, shut up, you know? And so I've really had to work on that, but it's really been, you know, them pointing out to me that I have that inner inside myself. And as I accept that, they become, they have less and less power over me, right. you know, to trigger me. And my trigger is way softer. It takes a little longer. I sometimes, Every once in a while, still, I'll be like, mm, F you. And then I'm like, uh, discard, you know? But I'm getting to the point where it's like, I'm just getting better at ignoring all that because it's ignoring the negative in me, yeah. which may, you know, you, you kind of want to get it. But will we ever transcend the light and dark in us? I don't know. I'll, I'll let you know on my last day of life, you know, if I'm still working on it. Yeah, it's, it's like that quote. It's like, you think you're enlightened go talk with your parents yeah right? which you know i get i i do really great with my parents they're cool we chill you know yeah. so i'm pretty good with that um, usually, usually for most them. people for most people there's like a, something their parents do that always trigger them you know or they say or do or something but and i think that's a really important it's like the, the person that triggers me is me well anyone can do whatever they want I am concerned with what this guy's thinking, what he's doing, what are his actions. And, and those are the ones that bother me. And I think that that's a good thing because I've, it's very easy for me to forgive others because I've made so many mistakes and so many errors. I have no right to judge anyone in small ways. I probably do. Um, but I, I try my best. But, you know, I'm really, I, I'm pretty critical of this guy and I'm really trying to learn to love him, accept him, the grays and the beard and the wrinkles, you know, it's like, it's, it's hard. You're on YouTube and you're supposed to be this raw foodie and you're supposed Dude, to be- Dude, you look the stuff. same now when you look when you were 30, man. Like- Well, I, I, thanks, man. I, 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 don't, I don't even know how old you are now, but it doesn't look like you've aged much. Like, sure, the hair has maybe changed colors a bit, but you look like you're- still glowing man so well i have i'm 47 and in 2020 and 2021 when i was when i they, the, they locked us down and then i moved in with my girlfriend who it's hard to explain this because she's like the most amazing beautiful human being and i still love her but i knew i had to i have to do what i'm doing now i know that where i am is right because i feel a thousand times better i was hopelessly depressed mm -hmm. Hopelessly. This was just like a, a year ago. Um, yeah, about a year ago today. Really, oh. I was just down in the dumps, and and that's when the beard started to go gray. I mean, I maybe it's timing too, but I will tell you, stress will make your hairs go gray. Stress will cause you to wrinkle. Stress is the worst. Everyone can fight about the food thing, and and I've had a lot of stress, so. It is hard in a way. I mean, I, I look still pretty decent considering everything I've gone through and I'm very grateful, but I'm not, I'm not like a Lou Corona or a Marcus Rothkrantz and people tell me, oh, I don't say that, but I don't want that pressure on me. And I don't, that's not who I am. I want to be known because I want to, I want to be like 92 gray and old and still have um, that, <laughs> that value, you know, of, what what we what our real value comes from the source and what we're uh, what we let come through us that was yesterday's uh, uh that was yesterday's workout that was just yesterday here in the desert dude it's like in the middle of winter it's freezing in the morning 
but then the sun comes out and it's 55 degrees and you're getting a nice suntan. It's nuts, dude. I really like it here, but there's a lot of chemtrails, man. Damn, you've never seen so many goddamn chemtrails. In this this, is this your kitchen where you live now? No, that was uh, where that was my, our mansion on the hill overlooking the ocean. I lived like a king in Hawaii. This was, this was Kauai. Two mansions, yeah, and that was uh, my girlfriend's house now. And that was that was how we rolled. That was that Dude, was these that was these sprouted pumpkin seeds, man. Wow, those are like crack. Oh my god, I can't even eat those anymore. Dude. Those are They're way good. too good. I um, hold that back. Pine pineapple looks insane. Oh like, my god, dude! Perfect. You, there's you have never had a pineapple on the mainland, unless no. you had a. Uh, if you had, I went to a farm once, and there was hundreds of dead, ripe, sunburst, ecstasy, nectar, pineapples. And when you, when they're golden yellow and you pop those off, it is pure nectar divinity. And there's not as, if the fruit is, it's, the fruit here is like four out of 10. The fruit there is like eight, nine, and sometimes 10 out of 10. But I, I'm living off oranges. And right now? Apple season, when there was apples, local apples, I was living off apples, apple juice, you know? Now it's oranges, local. I try to, that's what I'm attracted to is the local food because that has the highest electrical potential, which is what Kauai foods had. Yeah. And I miss Kauai for that, but the governor's there, democratic. They're like very into this whole thing. It's like one of the tightest. Wow. Right now they're still going on. It's like, have you woke up yet? There's nothing. It never was nothing. It's not real. You know, none of it is real. You're talking about Santa Claus, right? It's, it's a Santa Claus. I see Santa Claus. Okay. But I don't see no virus. <laughs> I see, I see humans exposed to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of viruses a day, not different types, thousands of different types, your dog, your cat, the bird flies by and you breathe in viruses. The, the plants all release viral fragments. Every living thing is releasing. Viruses are an incredibly important part of life. They're, they are evolution. Mm. And so to be afraid of them is, you know, anyways, that's a conversation you don't even want to have with these communists. And it so, triggers everyone's buttons. So they it, got psyop, you know? <laughs> if, 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 if we were to look at how, okay, so, so you, you break your fast for something juicy, you get the bulk of your work slash, I mean, day in between say 10 and what, four, and then you have dinner around four? Yep, that's about right. Um, dinner around, I'll, if, if, if I do go like once or twice a week, I'll go to an after, an evening yoga class um, at, from four to five, and then I'll be back here by 5.30 for a later dinner. But I usually try to start around 3.30. I start thinking, you know, let's get dinner rolling. And, you know, that's when I have a meal. And that's like salad with guac, avocado? or. Um, so what I'll do is I'll have the water and a juice and maybe another juice within that time, just ripping through, you know, bike ride, get back from a bike ride, cucumber juice, watermelon. So we'll have like water, juice, juice, and then salad. And that's salad. about... 70% of the time, 70, 75% of the time, that's the method. There has been a lot more um, mono fruit meals for dinner. These little tiny mandarins, I'll just eat like two or three bags of those or oranges. And then I'll have an avocado for dessert. Um, and there are more and more nights of me drinking just juice for dinner um, or having like a smoothie with some pyridine protein. Uh, like a gorilla milk or a banana smoothie, working my way towards liquidarianism. Yeah. But the but the salad is like the salad is my one drug, you know, that I have left that I use to nurture myself and calm down and chewing and you know I eat a lot of romaine because there's a good supply of romaine and I'll just take. Uh, you know, some, I'll make a dressing out of Pyridine Natural or throw some avocados or some walnuts. Um, I love olive oil. I know it's frowned upon, but I really feel- Did Tavis, like, did Tavis get you into that? 
Tavis really did. Oh, sorry, sorry, Tavis, oil. Tavis, yeah. Yeah, he, uh, his dad was huge on the olive oil. His dad was a lot like me. He was like a guru and he'd stand on his head and talk about breathing. And what, so, so, so let's briefly talk about that because a lot of people come from, you know, the Woodstock Fruit Fest community where avocado, durian are like the main fat source, the sure nuts and seeds, but people are pretty much against oil there. So what was the rationale for adding in oil such as olive oil? I mean, dude, it's like fruit juice. You know, olives are the dankest. If you've ever had a truly tree ripened olive that falls on the ground and ripens up, you mm. will know true ecstasy or a truly sun-dried Peruvian olive with no salt, just a meaty mineral balm, dude, the tree of peace, because it's so, because fat is peace, because calories are peace for the people and the animals living in those areas. And so we can't really get the olives, but we can get at least some of the extract. Gotcha. So, so if you could get the olives, you would, but since you can't, you have the extract. Yeah. That's and it. it just, it makes the salads nice and delicious. Nice. It's a little bit of a, you know, I'll take a cauliflower and broccoli and make a big pile and just. So what's the dressing recipe? We've got olive oil, some sea salt or. Uh, I, I am, I'm really working on getting off the salt. Uh, but the problem is, is like I had, I had it gone because it's literally like, I mean, it's just not, not for everybody, but for me, I have a, I'm a hairpin trigger addict boy, you know? Yeah. Oh, a little bit of salt. Okay. You know, it's salt is neutral, but more of the spices. I found the garlic, the onions, the hot peppers, which I had a, you know, the, the garlic and the onions is more of a nervous system stimulant. The hot peppers produce endorphins and have nervous system stimulation. So there's, it can be an addictiveness there because you can get those endorphins from the hot peppers, but then they wear off. And then you kind of have inflammation and stuff Interesting. irritating. Oh, this is all coming from the meditation and just, okay, I'm going to eat this food and then right. I'll wake up tomorrow and we'll see. And I've found, you know, plain ass fruits, avocados, bananas, you know, simple, the more, si the more simple, the better, you know, and it, it varies. It goes up and down. I don't have one specific thing. I don't, I try not to, unless I am like juice fasting or right, right. water fasting, yeah. you know, but, but I try to just, I go with my intuition. Like, what do you need tonight? So, buddy? so, so an average, average salad dressing for you might be a little bit of olive oil, what some lemon juice or. Well, I only do the olive oil, like maybe once a week or once every other week. Okay. My main dressing are the pyridine dressings where okay. I take the coconut almond yogurt. Cause that's the most easily digestible and the healthiest too, because that's the whole foods. You take the coconut, the almonds, blend those together with the pyridine probiotics, the natural protein, the life essentials. Then you've got this yogurt that's just creamy, delicious, packed with nutrition. Now you can take a bundle of dill, a little sea salt and some lemon mm. and blend that up. Boom. Or you can take some basil and lemon. Nice. And, you know, if you're in that phase, a jalapeno, you know, um, and you blend that up or, you know, um, what else is there? There was, I always, the angel sauce. When I was in Hawaii, I would get the mac nuts that were fresh. Then you take the coconut and the macadamia nut and then a garlic, lemon, and sea salt, and you make an angel sauce. Okay. And so, but I, I usually do the pyridine, uh, dressings. Those are pretty much because then you can drown your salad and it's pure nutrition and the yeah. protein, you know, if I get the protein, I got a little bit more on me, you know, I'm like 170, 175. Do you find that if you, if you eat like super high carb, low fat, low protein, muscle starts to go away. But when do you find that when you add in more protein, the muscle stays a lot longer and grows faster? And yeah. And it, it's when I fast, the weight stays on a little longer, oh. you know? So yeah, you can kind of pump up with carbs and I've done it for years off and on all kinds of stuff. I'll be rolling around 160. You know, sometimes I'll get down to like 155, one. You're six, you're six two, right? So two, 
and I'm 172, 173 right now, probably if I stepped on the scale, but if I just eat fruit and low fat and low protein, I'll go down to like 160, you know, sometimes even down to 155 if I'm really busy and super, super like Woodstock fruit festival, 80, 10, 10 clean. Yeah. And it's, I, me too, man. It's effortless. Like you just eat the fruit and then boom, you like lose anything excess. It's just Which is great. If you want to like, cause you know, the Buddha says the sage is a rack of bones. Cause you know, if you're really a sage and you're just there, you're like eating two oranges and you meditate for another three hours. All you're doing is it's all focus. Concentrate. Right. You're not out and about. I'm just, I keep it like that. Cause I'm, the videos and the job and the money, I don't want to, I'm not, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, but I am very attracted to the yogi of just skinny and nobody and he disappears. And yeah, because this the, the self-importance at least is lifting. Then the weight of all the oh, who am I? And I'm important. It's like you're not important. And so be free, you know, and you're like, oh, praise the Lord. I'm nobody. I'm not important. Thank God. I don't have to live up to anyone's expectations. I can get fat if I want. I can get skinny if I want. You know, I don't owe anyone anything. I can be free. Yeah. And it's hard to let go in this world of you're youthful and you're so muscular and you're so slender and you're so tan and you, you're so this and you're so that and you fit right into my little box and it makes me comfortable and please don't change. Right. And you're like, well, I just want to lay around and get fat. You know, is that okay? And not try so hard. There's, there's something to be said about those effortless beings. And I'm on my way. It's divine laziness. It's like, oh, what is God going to do with this one today? But you're more like, okay, here's my goal sheet. I've got this vision board. I'm going to do this, do this, do this, do this. And you do it. You're intentionally living and you're creating. And that's beautiful. But as you get more and more evolved, you're like, I'm just going to let God do this. I'm the puppet. It's an illusion anyways. And you'll see it. I'm a conglomeration of programs. And a lot of the things that we do come out of fear or what if it's not going to work out or I have to have this. How am I going to retire? They won't love me anymore. I, you know, all the pressures. And what Dan McDonald is doing is he's like figuring out as much as he can to let go of all that pressure. So I'm grateful. I've, I've got, a, you know, some good years left in me. I don't want to fight to keep on muscle and to keep my tan body forever. Right now I'm doing it. It's kind of coming effortlessly and it's fun. But eventually I see the attraction to that divine laziness. It's so interesting, man. I, I feel the same way. I'm like, no, when I get to my 60s, 70s, I'm just going to go like Robert Lockhart mode and just fast and just get super skinny. That's like my long-term goal. Become super skinny. Back to 125 pounds because that's like my like natural weight. I'm 125. So, so for if me I to get like, relaxed, I get kind of chubby, you know? Oh, when I get relaxed, I just... Room. I have to work to keep on. And you have to work to keep on. Yeah. yeah. And I use the uh, pyridine protein and all the fats to add a little extra layer. Otherwise, this thing would be a lot smaller. And oh, he's got the arm flab, you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, so it just adds a nice little layer. You look a little bit better. You're more presentable. Blah blah blah. You know. But then eventually, you get over all that. You don't care what anyone thinks, yeah. but right now I'm still, the ego is still clinging real, not real hard. Cause it knows it's days are numbered. It's fought with me so long. I'm like, listen, God is going to win. Chill out. You know, the truth is going to win in the end, Mr. Ego. So quit clinging and quit averting just mm -hmm. be accept. So I can be calm. Cause I, I want to be chill for my own self. I've seen this guy can get so tight. He is tight. You could, oh, there's a coal up his ass and out comes a diamond, you know? And so it's no more just unraveling. That's what I want to do. man. And I know that my nervous system has needed that for all these years of fear and trauma and, you know, abuse and neglect and just, so love is kind of my next thing. You know, I just had, had this massage from this woman and I was like, damn, I need a woman like that because she was so masterful and so 10 out of 10. Beautiful. Those are rare. Those are rare. Those are rare. She was very, very inspiring, very gracious, masterful, beautiful oh. lady. So, so 
you have the dinner around four. What time's bedtime for DTM? What does he do right before bed? I'll tell you right now, bro, I went to bed early last night, like around seven. And I slept like a baby and I had kaleidoscope greens. And I said, tonight, I am going to bed early yep. again. Because, and then I wake up, I woke up, actually, I woke up at one and I felt really good. But then I was like, you know what? Now let's do that cool thing that you do where you go back to sleep and you program yourself with this cool stuff. And then I had, here we go again. I mean, Mr. You know, I just had dreams about beautiful women. You know, nothing sexual, just just joy and love and happiness. And the dreams were awesome. It was like that deep, dank, sleepy dream. Then I woke up at like four and then I just laid there. Uh, and I just, that's, I love four o'clock in the morning because then I just, that's when I pray. And I don't really ask for anything except like guidance. Mm. You know, show me the way. What do I need to do today to, um, to, 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 to free myself from this pain and this uh, tightness. And, you know, so I ask to open up to and receive knowledge and information and guidance so that I can live in the most high divine because that's where you're going to find the most ease and the most peace and the most grace is when we just, you know, allow you know, the divinity to be there and just, so I don't really have, I'm very free. This is important to me. Freedom is my number one virtue. I have to be free. I will live in a cardboard box. I will not be in debt to anyone. I will not be enslaved to anyone. I will not be enslaved to a drug, a chemical, a, a substance. I will not be an alcoholic. I will not be addicted to coffee. I will not be addicted to weed. I will not be addicted to food. I will not be addicted to coffee or to hot peppers or anything. So, I won't even let myself be addicted to lettuce. I'll be like, you ain't getting a salad tonight, son, because you have had a salad every night for the past two weeks. You are having fruit tonight. So you have to, just because I will not. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? I, I, I get that too. Like fruit is the one food to me that like I feel my, minus tomatoes and durian. Fruit, fruit is the one food to me where there's no addictive pull to it. Like if maybe again, durian and tomatoes. Sure. I got to like hold back on those, but if I'm having like apples or some grapefruit or some watermelon, there's no addictive pull to it at all. Although I do love it. It's delicious. It makes me feel great. I don't feel like I need to, you know, restrict myself from it in any way, shape or form. Yes. Ted, I bet you believe it's the most satisfying, right? Yeah. It, it's, it, it satisfies you because you know, when you have a big salad, it's like delicious, but you're kind of like, oh, you know, like too many mixtures and uh, yeah, kind of regret that, but at least it was raw, you know? Yeah. But then when you, when you eat like six or eight oranges and you're like, God, that was just, there was nothing. I can't complain. I'm full. I'm nourished. I'm hydrated. I'm not too full. I'm not bloated. It's just, and you just never regret fruit. And when you do mono meals or two or three kinds, you just eat just the right amount, but with the salt and the spices and the mixtures, you're just, oh, this is good. My stomach hurts. What is yeah. Cause you're like, hey, this is so good. Just keep eating. And you're like, oh. dude, every time, man. So relatable. So relatable. Yeah. And that's what we're, and dude, and we all do it. But eventually we're going to become masters yeah. and we're going to eat the small little bit. We're going to just eat the grapes and Osborne and level. Huh? And Osborne level. Yeah, I mean, I I do I find this is the thing though, you know, the 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 yogurt is the same way. The 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 the, the yogurt. Now when you put the salt and the garlic and the spices, that, that kind of changes it. Then you eat more. But if you have like um the yogurt with bananas or with blueberries or with other berries, or just eat the yogurt itself or you just drink the gorilla milk, one quart. There's a satisfaction there, but then you get the fats and the proteins, which then keep a little bit of weight on. So you look a little more presentable and you have actually, I've found that the protein gives me more energy at the workouts in the, um, when I juice fast, I have that like glucose energy 
Yeah. But the muscular power, power. Is yeah, there. power. I so feel when that. I'm at the gym, or not at the gym, but when I'm at the yoga studio, I can feel it's like, oh, you don't want to do that. The bonus push ups because you can right. option five push ups or, or no, you know. And you're like, when you're on the protein, you do like 10, you know, all the other girls are on their knees and you're like doing 10. And yeah. um, so the protein gives the muscles a little bit more oomph. You know, right. so I can understand all the carnivores and stuff because they have the big muscle because they need to go out and kill another animal tomorrow. So nature and the microbes associated with the breakdown of meat create like larger, stronger, tighter muscles because tomorrow you got to go do the same thing. It's like a lion. Look how strong they are. And so I can totally dig it. It's just what are your priorities, you know, and then for us vegans, the amino acids are really, really cool, too, but it's more gorilla strength alkaline type of muscles and they may not be as dense um, necessarily but all that depends a lot on genetics and stuff but I've found what I've found though is that I really do enjoy carbs proteins and fats and I feel like the simple foods like the oranges or the watermelons or the grapes or the bananas but also the coconuts and the coconut mm -hmm. meat is in that category. Yeah, yeah. As well as avocados, a couple of avocados, and you're like, ah, oh, so there's just these ones over here right now, they're like meatballs, they're just thick, buttery, meaty avocados. And I love avocados. My body does well with fat, protein, and carbs, but the psychological, uh, the fruit, the clean um, fruit, whole fruit, just there's something about it. There's no other level of satisfaction. It's perfection. It really, it really is. Perfection. And that's really what, because we are light, yeah. all of it just, it's all just poop. It's very expensive poop. And people make up all these uh, nutritional things. And once you've gone down this road, like I have with the fasting and the raw foods and stuff, it's just poop. Something's going on, but nobody knows really what. There's something about a microbiology and then, you know, the glucose, but it's, it's all water soluble. Even the fats and the proteins need to be broken down into water soluble juices in order to pass through the blood brain, the, the, the gastrointestinal tract barrier to make it into the bloodstream, which is usually just microscopic fragments of the food and probably the metabolic byproducts of the microorganisms. So I think our consciousness and our body and our genetics are formulated out of the metabolic byproducts of the uh, metabolites from the microorganisms breaking down whatever stuff we're stuffing down in there. And I believe the microorganisms from living food produce the most amount of sort of life consciousness metabolites, right. as opposed to um, you know, other foods that have already been broken down on the stove and they're already in a state of decomposition. Right. We are the juicer and we are the stove. And by the time it reaches your colon, now it's starting to decompose and you, but then there's the decomposition and that's why the humans are going through all the stuff they're going through. And so it's good to keep the temple as clean as you can while maintaining and stability and balance in whatever way you need to i definitely learned there's no right or wrong and nobody has all the answers you know but just if we can recommend though self-care like treat yourself like a king you know some days i'm king some days i'm princess it depends on if i want to use essential oils and go get a massage and a get hot a hot bath yeah dude, oh i'm princess in the bath yeah dude. And then so, someday just king, like I'm going to watch a movie. I'm going to ignore the damn phone. We're going to watch Troy again, or my favorite movie, uh, the Count of Monte Cristo, you know, an old classic gladiator, Star Wars, whatever. You know, that's my, that's King day. And turn the phone off, leave it in the room. Boom. Go to, you know. So if we, if we can wrap this up in three minutes, I'm going to ask you three questions. We got a minute answer for each of them. All right. Okay. Okay. So rapid fire. This is DTM you're talking to. <laughs> yeah, for most people, rapid fire is 10 seconds. I'll give you 60 seconds per per question. So I want to finish up the day in your life. So what do you do right before bed? What's your go-to habit right before bed? 
every single night of my life, I listen to a spiritual master tell me to look inwards and find the truth. Sweet, man. There every we night. go. There every we go. Night. And I, oh, thank God. Thank God for Ramana Maharshi, Nisargadatta Maharaj, Dr. David Hawkins, Sivananda, Vivekananda, Ramakrishna. They loved God. They were God. And, and, and you'll just listen to this on your Audible account on your phone? Audible or just YouTube, man. I listen to the Dhammapada over and over and over. The teachings of the Buddha. He just says mm. it straight. So next question. I'm looking forward to this one. What's something that you strongly believe in that most people including myself, would probably disagree with you on? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I wish I could say the celibacy thing, but I think you practice some continence after uh, all your years of debauchery. <laughs> but that's that. a good one because I don't know if I believe in it. So that's a good one. Well, I mean, there's something I believe in it for myself. Yeah. I believe that if you want to get something done, and you really want to have all your energy and all your focus and all your power and all your light, then you preserve the golden oil that flows from your testicles up your spine into your brain and it feeds your brain and you build ohas mm. energy in your mind to focus. I have, after 21 years of off and on, I would say that that I really do believe in. And okay. there's a lot to that that I could experience. Now do you, when you say celibacy, do you simply mean holding in the, as you call it, what do you call it? The golden oil? What do you call it? The golden Christos. fluid? The Christos. The, the Christos. The, the Christos. Christos oil of so, the mind. So, so do, phosphorus and zinc and other minerals that but feed But do you believe, plants when you say world. celibacy, do you mean just holding in the seed or not acting in the sexual way at all? Okay, I'll, I'll do the quick version here. There's continents which is making love to your lady five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times a day, but never releasing your seed. That's she called continence? That is sexual continence. That oh, is that's preserving cool. the seminal fluid, but pumping like a monkey. Okay. okay that's cool. That works real well too, because yeah. the lady's happy. You're happy. You're getting it done. You're pumped up. Everybody's happy. She's doing the dishes. You're laying out. <laughs> Taking a nap. No, you don't even take a nap unless you bust a nut. Then you yeah. take a nap. So there's continence. Then there's celibacy, which you do after a relationship to get all the cords cut. You don't go jumping into someone else. You wait a year or two after a long-term relationship. You do some fasting. You cut the cords. You get yourself back in alignment. Then mm. you can open up to someone else again. Or you can do celibacy for spiritual purposes, artistic and creative purposes, financial purposes, goal-oriented purposes. Like, hey, honey, we need to get money to save a house. Let's be celibate for a year wow. or until, let's be celibate until we get the down payment for the house. Wow. That's what she's out working. She's got energy. It wow. may cause stress, but if you really realize the focus of intention and the creative life force energy between man and woman and that polarity that can build, 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 and that energy, then you focus it on, we need $250,000. We have 10 right now. And let's focus everything on that. And wow. then we'll have like rabbits and then we'll make a couple of kids once we have a house so there's that that is celibacy and there's many other ranges to that too and then there's brahma sharia which is all is devoted to the one all is devoted to brahman so you there's know? no more sex ever no and there's also the cleaning up of the thoughts i'm not quite there yet at all um i am cultivating it slowly in my own time um, but I am, you can work on cleaning up your mind with the sexual fantasies and masturbation and just cleaning up your mind. Because if you play with thing, this, these, these things in your imagination, you'll end up attracting them, you know? And so I'm just in that vein. I'm not, I never try to tell anyone what to do or anything like that because I don't want to be a guru, but I'm just more like, I'm just trying to be as pure as I can be without, you know, uh, being brutal or harsh to myself, but I have found that right now in this phase that I'm at with the regeneration, uh, the, the breakthrough that I need once and for all, that I have found it's very wise for me to preserve my fluid and my energy uh, 100% um, at this time. And th there's nobody that loves women 
more than me. There's nothing better than intimacy and warmth and touching. Touching is my love language and I don't have any other women. They're like, oh, this is my love language. You're like, honey, you're all five. You love gifts, words of praise, touch, all that. I noticed that too. I I, felt, I actually believe the same thing. I believe, I believe, I believe that too. I think they're all five. Women are all five and men usually just have one yeah. and, a, and maybe another one, but mine is touch. I don't need your money, words of praise or nothing. I just touch me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And not no. even in a sexual way, just rub my head. Yeah. Put me to sleep like a kitty cat. I will, yeah. I will build you your own God dang, you know, castle with my bare hands and a shovel. If you rub my head and help me at the end of the day, after a long day to just. This head, right? Yeah, exactly. Cause uh, I mean, I, I rather preserve my fluid. I like to, I like to make women feel good. You know, I'm, I'm very good with my hands. And when you have that <laughs> celibacy, they can, it, the energy goes right to your thumbs. I've had a million massages, so I know how to touch. And I've had many women tell me I've never been touched that way before. So it's sad. These dudes, I need to make a video on how to massage a woman. Because these dudes, they just, they're just, they want the touchdown right now. I'm saying, enjoy the game, brother. You they know? want the touchdown. They want the touchdown. And I'm like, just enjoy the game, bro. So last, last, last question. Uh, and we got to wrap this up because I'm late. Uh, uh oh. What's, it's okay. Uh, what's one piece of advice? that you'd give someone if they ask you, Hey, Dan, I saw the interview with you and Ted, Are you talking about your perfect day in the life. How do I have a perfect day in life? My life sucks right now. I want to have a perfect day in the life like you as well. What one piece of advice would you give someone to help them have a perfect day in life? Oh my God. The perfect day. Oh, that's a real illusion. <laughs> Good luck. The <laughs> perfect day is a day where you have, a failure and a victory. If you don't have a failure in a day, you're on the wrong course. You know what I mean? If your illusion of having the perfect day is not having any trouble, your bar and your standards are too low. You should make- I love that, dude. I love oh, that. Several That's mistakes. Nice. Dude, my bar is up here. I have done nothing but fail this whole time. But I have failed my way to this point, which is like sober and sober on food, and sober on women, and sober on social media, and sober on drugs, and sober on chemicals, and stimulants, and coffee, and chocolate. And, you know, so, yeah, but still the bar is high, and I don't want to lower it. Mine is set true north, top of the mountain, all the way to the end, and then I'm just going to enjoy this. It doesn't matter if I get there in this lifetime. The trajectory is set. I'm building karma for a more propitious birth next time. And, and, propitious. And, yeah, a more beneficial. Like maybe the next lifetime, my parents will be like yogis, you know, instead of like tokis, you know? <laughs> and But no, my parents are awesome. I wouldn't change anything. I'm glad to be here. I think that God has a purpose for Dan to reach out and do what he's done with the YouTube. Yeah. And um yeah, it should be just raise your bar higher. And the other th thing would be to, you know, find one thing, one thing that really matters. And everything else will have to become harmonized around that. Otherwise, you won't achieve it. Is it financial? Is it relationship? Is it health wise? Like, oh, you're 100 pounds overweight? Like, I am going to lose a hundred pounds. I saw a DTM. That's what I'm doing. Yes, you go to work. Yes, you kiss your wife and make love to her. Yes, you take the kids to the park. But all the while, everything you do is for that hundred pounds of weight loss. Everything you do is for that $250,000 down payment on a house. Everything you do is to grow your business to 500,000 subscribers. Whatever, you know, that one thing is burn. In every nerve, every blood, every sweat, every tear is guided to that one thing. And it makes it easy, but you'll see that all the other areas in your life improve as well, because you don't have time for stress. You've got $250,000 to make for a down payment. You don't have time for drama. You have to meditate and get right, straight, regenerated. You got to get through this fast, this juice cleanse. You don't have time to waste with low vibrations. You can't go out with your friend 
and go drink it. You make better decisions when you have that one thing that really matters to you, not that matters to your mom or your grandma or your pastor or the people on YouTube, but what really matters to you? What is your heart burning for? And I know mine is just that complete healing, that regeneration, and it's been a great path. And then, so out of that, I have great finances and I have great health and I have, I don't do drama because I don't have time for it. It gets in the way. So that one thing will clean up everything else and master one thing, master them all because it's pure consciousness. It's awareness. Boom. So, so, so to sum that up, it's focus, find that one thing and focus on it and don't be afraid of failure to fail every day. If you're not failing, your bar's not set high enough. You right. have to learn. I mean, how do we learn? By failing. We fail our way to success 100%. And, and you can't share where you're failing on YouTube because you got your little marketing thing and you got your little brand and you can't tell everyone, wow, I really went off the rails this weekend. <laughs> you know, keep that to yourself. You be honest and integrity and then you get back on course, mm. you know? we all make a lot of mistakes, you know, and you don't have to share them with everyone. They're yours. They're your stepping stones, you know? Dude, that's, you such a, it's such a, that's such a refreshing message, man. More people need to hear that. Can't be afraid to failure. You can't be afraid to fail. You can't be afraid of setting the bar super high. And you got to be able, you got to be willing to sacrifice. Focus on that one thing and everything else you sacrifice. It's gone. It's the one thing. Because I'll tell you, I've said this, this came to me very recently. Pleasure is no substitute for joy. And we live in the world of hedonism and pleasure like nothing else. And those short-term dopamine hits will never match up to the long-term satisfaction of those that serotonin flow. Pleasure is no substitute for joy. That's dope. I've never heard that before. I love that. It really ain't. And that's, that's my mantra. That's so my favorite I thing that you've said over the past couple hours, dude. Yeah, well, remember it, dude, and for everybody, because it's a mantra that I live by. And then what you can do is you like, you see it, you're like, oh, the grocery store, you want to get that, your friend calls you up, let's go smoke, let's go that's, drink. Let's go that's do not it. joy. You can start, you can start to discern between what's joy and what's not. It's like, oh, that's pleasure, but that's not joy. I mean, dude, I'm telling you, joy arises from the emptiness, you know, <laughs> joy, like from the I mean, you live on emptiness and that's the fullness. It's all the small, tiny little stuff that pulls us off track and we lose the essence of being awareness, consciousness, you know, and then the world sells us. We got to see through all the propaganda, the corporate pumping you full of the, the guys smoking cigarettes and drinking beer with a six pack on the thing. It's like, if I drank beer and smoked them cigarettes, I wouldn't have a six pack. I'd have a one pack, a fat belly with all that liver. So God bless everyone. I love you, Ted. I've been watching you for years. I've been keeping low profile, but I really do want to get a hold of you and um, yeah. talk to you about some of your methods of refinement for my business. Cause it's, yeah. I think it's about time I did that. A couple you know? small tweaks, man. And things are very different guaranteed. Okay. So um, I sent you my number. Yeah. We'll, I'll be in touch. Me. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Ted. Yeah. I had a really great time today, bro. I love, I love the cord dangling from the hat, dude. That's the oh, yeah, that's what I do. It's that's here. It's all weird. And yeah, it's just, this is where the sound is the best for the microphone here on the camera. Cool, dude. I'll, uh, Thanks for the opportunity to share Ted and, yeah. uh, um, I'll put your, uh, what, what, what's your, what, where would you want traffic to go to? What, what link? My YouTube channel is good. Okay, cool. Um, so I will, uh, just, I'll just link that over there. I'll send it to you. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Ted. Peace too much. Love. Thanks for taking your time, man. Two hours and 11 minutes of DTM's time. That's, that's value, man. I'll never forget that. Appreciate it. It's been fun. You're a real great interviewer and uh, you're a bright light, Ted. And I <laughs> you really too, do appreciate you, bro. I, I, I think just, I am a okay. result of everyone I've consumed and I've consumed a lot of you. I've consumed a lot of you. I watched you for dude, hundreds of hours, easily hundreds of hours. Same videos on repeat, dude, at the trailer park. Oh, boy, the old trailer park, man. That's, that's a funny story. We were actually hiding because we couldn't pay the bill on the trailer. So we went behind that closed yellow gate at Lake Bronson Family Nudist Park. It was her trailer, you know, and then eventually they came and towed it from us. 
But um, yeah, then, then I lived in my truck and then I met Ricky Breslin. Then we started a website. Then I made the DVDs. Then I dug myself out of massive amounts of debt. And I really appreciate everyone on YouTube and just interviews. And now I'm in a good place because my, my, I've lowered and simplified and yet I've got a nice little evergreen flow kicking. Sweet. I'm very grateful to everyone. You can't imagine how much I hope that what I'm doing here is giving back in some way or another. 100%. Share today. Good. 100%. 100%. I want everyone to win. Let's all win. People need to hear it, man. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm never going to forget that. Pleasure is no substitute for joy. That's my, that's my new thing. Amen, bro. Well, we could talk about that more in detail. We'll do this again sometime, yeah. Ted, because your energy really pulled out the best of me today. And I'm very grateful for that. You're a true. You're, the, you're one of the good ones, bro. For real. Appreciate that, man. All right, Ted. Yeah. Talk and, to you soon. And in case you thought I was standing weird, it's because I'm walking slowly on a treadmill. I should have told you at the start. Oh, really? Yeah, I that's what that, that's why I'm like shifting back and forth. I should have told you that. Oh, you were just drunk on fermented fruit. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm walking. Anyways. Okay. Well, I'll talk to you again soon, yeah. Ted. Cheers, God bless you. Peace, man. Much Peace. love. Later.